Hey everybody, welcome to Restored Community Church. We are so glad that you are here this weekend. If this is your first time here, welcome. We're glad that you are here. There's those blue cards that are right in front of your the seat backs. You can grab one of those, fill it out, and uh, actually head to our Connect Center on your way out and, and leave here with a gift to remember us by. You can also, um, if you guys are watching from online, you can uh, connect with us on our website with those eConnect cards. We're so glad that you guys are tuning in and watching from wherever you guys might be watching from and uh, just to be a part of the uh, Restored at Home family. We do have a couple announcements that we do wanna make sure that you guys are aware of. Both our men and women's Bible studies will be starting the first week of September, so it's just right around the corner. Our women are gonna have two different studies going on at the same time. One of them is a topical Bible study going, looking through the book uh, entitled, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And those will be at 7 p.m. on Thursday nights. Uh, but also, we're, they're gonna have their precept studies looking at the book of Ruth, and that will be at 9.30 in the morning, as well as 7 p.m. on those Thursday nights. So make sure that you sign up for that on our website or right here in the lobby. And we also have our men, they are gonna be meeting on Wednesday nights, so just before the women, uh, and that'll be on, at 7 p.m. as well, and they're gonna be studying the, the book of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And so um, the title of that study is gonna be The Way to Endure Through Trials. So highly encourage you guys to sign up for that on our website or right here in the lobby. Our Restored Christian Preschool is just around the corner. We're so excited, we've been waiting for it for so long. And our grand opening is gonna be Tuesday, September 5th, okay? There's a couple more spots left, but they are certainly filling up fast. So you make sure that you wanna get on our website, sign up for those spots. If you know anybody, uh, or if you have preschoolers of your own, make sure to sign up for that. We also, we're looking to hire, uh, we have one more spot open for a part-time position, a, a teaching position. So if you guys are interested in that or know anybody, make sure that you sign up for that on our website as well. Hey, one more reminder, we do have coming up this upcoming Monday, August 28th, we're gonna be launching, it's gonna be our fall kickoff for our youth group again, all right? This whole summer we've been on break, we've been doing lots of events and stuff, but we're gonna get back to our Monday night meetings. And so 6.30 to 8.30 on Monday night, if you have junior hires or high schoolers, make sure that you guys come and hang out, it's gonna be a blast. Well, we are so blessed by all the ways that you guys so generously give what God has blessed you with. Whether that be your time, your talent, or your treasure, we couldn't do what we do here at Restored if it wasn't for you guys. So thank you. There's tons of ways to give. There's ways to give in the back. You can text to give. You can give by mail. You can do it on our website. We thank you guys so much for that. Well, that's enough announcements for me. RCC starts right now. One more thing, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ellen Freeman, and I'm with Moms in Prayer International. And Moms in Prayer is an organization that prays for kids, schools, teachers, and staff. And we've got groups in over 150 different countries throughout the world. And their whole goal is to impact kids and schools for Christ. And so they do this by meeting weekly and praying scripture over their kids. So if you're interested in learning how to bathe your kids in prayer, um, I'll have a table outside with more information about Moms in Prayer, come see me. But today is what we call Bless Our School Sunday. And this is a time when churches throughout the world get together and pray for our students, our schools, teachers, and staff. And so that's what we want to do here today at RCC. So if you would help me and just join me in praying for them, I'd so appreciate it. Let's bow together. Dear Lord, we want to lift up first our students to you. Lord, help them to be strong in you and your mighty power. It is your hand that will sustain them, your arm that will strengthen them. May they become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Help them shine like stars in the universe as they hold firmly to your word. Lord, give them strength so they do not conform to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of their minds. We ask that you would protect them and guide them on the right path that you have for each of them. 
And Lord, for our teachers, we lift up our teachers, staff, and administrators to you. Help them not become weary in doing good. Remind them that as they persevere and trust in you at the proper time, they will reap a harvest if they do not give up. Fill them with your strength and endurance. May they be lights unto those around them and have courageous faith, standing up for what is right, pure, true, and noble. We pray for your protection and blessing over them and their families. Those who do not know you, we pray that their eyes be open, turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in you, Christ. And finally, Lord, we lift up our schools to you. We pray for your protection over our schools, both physically and spiritually. Lord, place strong Christians into leadership roles. Fill them with your wisdom. Lead them along straight paths. As they make decisions, may integrity and uprightness protect them because their hope is in you, Lord. We pray against any unholy curriculum and protocols that go against your word. To you, Lord, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, we pray your will be done over all our schools. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Will you guys stand as we worship the Lord today? We're going to sing Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me. For me, for me. Jehovah Jireh. Provider, His grace is sufficient for me. Oh, my God shall supply all my need according to His riches and glory. He shall give His angels turn over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Amen. Sing that again, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. And yes, my God, my God shall supply all my needs. According to His riches and glory, yes, He shall give His angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Oh, yes, my God shall supply all my needs. According to his riches and glory, he shall give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. For me, for me, Jehovah Jireh cares for me.
may be seated. Music has been long, a long time anchor in my life. And a couple of years ago, the Lord gave Debbie and I a song right before we went through a storm, a very difficult storm, when we lost our oldest daughter very suddenly. Sometimes we forget how big our God is, especially when Something like that comes suddenly upon us. King David tells us in Psalm 40, 28, 29, Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases their strength. What's your giant? Is it the giant of a broken relationship? Is it the giant of a financial challenge or a medical challenge? Perhaps the loss of a loved one? Maybe it's the giant of loneliness. Whatever it is, don't forget, our God is bigger than this. I'm caught up in a agency With all this chaos and confusion I I can hardly breathe The waves come crashing in Darkness surrounds me So relentless I feel like I'm drowning My God is bigger than this He's bigger than this My God is bigger than this His love is greater My God is bigger than this He's bigger than this My God is bigger than this His love is greater yeah. Oh yeah Well I don't know which way to go I can't see what's in front of me I'm done walking down this broken road 
Oh, I don't even know who I'll be, but a love sees farther than, farther than I'll ever know. And I find my strength in letting go. Cause my God is bigger than this. He's bigger than this. My God is bigger than this. His love is greater. My God is bigger than this. Yes, He's bigger than this. My God is bigger than this. His love is greater. Oh, yeah. Greetings, friends. Trust me, uh, that was an amazing song and so, such a blessing to, uh, to Debbie and I. That song really resonated with us. I hope it does with you. Turn with me in your Bibles. We are now in Genesis chapter 42. We're working our way through the life of Joseph. Last week, we learned that Joseph was 30 years of age when he stood before Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the entire world. And through God's leading, Joseph provided Pharaoh a glimpse into the future. Seven years of plenty Egypt would experience, followed by seven years of coming famine. As our story opens today, the seven years of plenty have ended and the famine has now gripped this powerful nation and the countries that surround it far and wide. Perhaps the transition period from plenty to want had taken a couple of years, and if that's true, it's been 25 years since Joseph's brothers have sold him into slavery. 25 years since they have laid eyes on their little brother not only has it been two and a half decades, but Joseph now looks more like an Egyptian than his old self, the Hebrew teenager. But I don't believe any of these played the primary role in their 
visual ignorance of him. They don't recognize him when they come back. I believe that the years of their tortured memories of one horrible day when they let their anger get the best of them and they sold their little brother into slavery, a day they worked hard at forgetting for over 25 years now, has caused the memory of Joseph's face to fade with time. I mean, surely he's dead now, right? The saying, time heals all wounds, may be popular, but without repentance, without honesty and regret, there can be no release of guilt. Only one's fragile willpower to forget the sin that so easily besets. The brother's sin is like a relentless cancer that doesn't go away. You cannot put a band-aid over a serious illness, as if in doing so you could make it go away. And neither can you cover your sin, ignore its existence before God, in the hope of removing it from your life. Repentance must take root before healing and restoration can take place. God's plan is to birth a nation from these 12 brothers, 10 of which are paralyzed in their sin. So he must first restore them to himself, their father, and of course, their little brother, Joseph. In our passage today, we will look at how God brought about the repentance of of the sins of these ten brothers, and it's a type of roadmap for ourselves as well. In this story, we will see the process for repentance, and that's the title of my sermon this week, The Process of Repentance. If you'd like to take notes, and I encourage you to do so, you can flip your bulletin over, you can follow along with us. Here's process number one we see the motivation for repentance. The motivation for repentance. For repentance and forgiveness to occur, we need to be motivated to repent. Let's begin now in our study, in our time in the Bible, Genesis 42, 1 through 5, as we begin. When jo Jacob saw that there was grain, there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother, Benjamin, for this, uh, for his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. The Israelite nation is a couple of hundred people right now. It may not seem like a lot compared to the number post-Egyptian release, but try feeding that many seven days a week, twice a day, during a famine. Not to mention the sheep that they had with them. They were motivated to act. Great leaders lead. And when people need to be called out, they hold people responsible. Jacob calls his sons out here for being lethargic and perhaps spineless. They're literally sitting there dying and Jacob goes, what are, you do? what are you looking at each other for? You know that there is grain in Egypt, and he tells them to go. The ten brothers seemed to be resigned to their fate, so dad had to come up with a plan for the salvation of the nation God had promised to him and to his fathers. Hunger is a powerful motivator, and God uses it to move these brothers into action. After all, they have a God-ordained appointment to keep in Cairo. There is grain in Egypt. The whole world seems to know this. So Jacob tells his ten eldest sons to go and purchase enough 
for their families and for their livestock. The fact that dad doesn't let Benjamin go with them suggests to me that the boys must have lost dad's trust over the years. Jacob already lost his favorite son, Joseph, when he sent him to check out his brothers. Now Jacob's completely unwilling to allow Benjamin, probably who is in his 30s now, his last tie to his beloved wife, Rachel, to go along with these ten. Now Egypt is no walk in the park either. From where they are currently, it's some 300 miles on foot. They'll be pulling donkeys with them, weighed down with grain on the return, and it will prob- probably take somewhere around 30 days to make the round trip in Egypt. First, a person, uh, first for a person to repent, they need to come to a place where they acknowledge their guilt and desire to change their life, and these ten brothers are about to be faced with just that. The process for repentance, process number one, we saw the motivation for repentance. And here's process number two, where we see the soberness of speech. The soberness of speech. When we're faced with our sin, we don't need someone to sugarcoat it. We need someone that will give it to us plainly to call it what it is. A wretched grievance between us and God. I don't need someone to tell me, well, what you did was just a mistake. Is it a, mis- is it a sin or is it a mistake? Well, you just, you just blew it. In our world, we don't like to say those, that three-letter word, sin. We like to call it something else. We like to sugarcoat it. But when the time comes here, you're going to see that this is not what the ten brothers need, nor is it what they receive. Verse 6, now Joseph was governor over the land. We learned this last week. He's the second most powerful man in the world. He is just under Pharaoh. And it was he who sold to all the people of the land, sold this grain. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. You remember, Joseph had dreamed that this would happen. And his brothers, boy, they got angry at him. Joseph saw his brothers, verse 7, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. He's suggesting that they have come to spy out how they might conquer a region and take the grain for themselves. That's what he's suggesting to his his ten brothers. Verse 10, And they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. I wonder if Joseph had to turn away when they said that. (laughs) Wait a minute. I don't recall that. I had a different experience with you last time we were together. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Verse 12. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness or vulnerability of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today. And one is no more. Interesting choice of words. (laughs) Can you imagine being Joseph? (laughs) Verse 14, but Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you saying, you are spies. (laughs) 
Joseph doesn't pull any punches here. On one hand, God is working through the wisdom he gave to Joseph in order to call out the sinful hearts of these ten brothers. But on the other hand, it must have been very difficult for him not to reveal himself to them in the hopes of a quick reunion. But before the family reunion, before the mariachi music can can begin, before the party, before dinner, authentic restoration must take place. Can't sugarcoat this one. Mm -mm. Joseph knows we got some stuff to work through before that can happen. You see, the truth needs to come out in order for real repentance and restoration to happen. And Joseph is moving to confront them to see the condition of their hearts. See, it's been 25 years. He wants to kind of explore where their hearts are right now and where these guys are. You see Joseph's wisdom and compassion here in this passage. Instead of holding all but one or two of the brothers in custody, he releases all but one. Joseph wants them to have a long discussion on the long journey home. He wants them to be able to transport enough food to feed his family back home. And he wants the brothers to get to work together to carry the difficult task of arriving safely back to dad. But he also wants to see God's vision revealed to him long ago in his two dreams to come about in his life. The vision revealed that all his brothers and that his father would bow down to him as the provider and savior. That's, you know, that's little s, savior. Remember, Joseph is a forerunner of the savior, Jesus Christ. He gives us a picture, gave them especially a picture of what the Messiah would look like when he came and this wouldn't happen unless joseph's words would sober the hearts of these brothers whose hearts were hardened sometimes you and i need to hear steeled words not placating platitudes proverbs 27 6 tells us this faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful Sometimes you need to be called out, and sometimes we need to call out somebody with truth. Yes, in love, but in truth. Before we can reach a place of repentance, we need to hear the truth. The process for repentance, process number one, we saw the motivation for repentance. In number two, we saw the soberness of speech. Joseph talks to them very roughly. And here's process number three. We see the solitude of the heart. The solitude of the heart. Verse 17. So he put them all together in prison three days. Solitude is a spiritual discipline. Whether we pause to pray, to ponder spiritual truth, or to ponder our wrongdoings, Getting alone with God is a really powerful practice for all of us. Mark 1.35 tells us that Jesus got up very early in the morning and went to a place of solitude to pray. And if He needed to, how much more do we need to? It might be in your closet or on your back patio, but going to a quiet place is good for our souls and our walks with God. In this case, the brothers had already had plenty of time to do this, but they failed. Joseph would give them the experience of what it was like to lose your freedom, something he knew quite well because of these brothers. And he would give them time to spend alone with their thoughts and with their God. Listen, don't make God put you in solitary confinement in order for you to hear him it can be very painful as well as frightening get up and go of your own free will and he will honor the time that you spend with him in silence alone with him to both talk with him and to listen to him as he speaks through the holy spirit and through 
his word. Process number one, we saw the motivation for repentance. Number two, we saw the soberness of speech. Process number three, we saw the solitude of the heart. And here's process number four. We see the obedience to change. The obedience to change. Verse 15. In this manner you shall be tested, Joseph said. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. For repentance to take place, honest confession of a changed heart must occur. Words can only take us so far. An honest confession of sin and a desire to be forgiven, which originates in one's heart, will lead to true repentance. Joseph told his ten brothers, if your words of confession are true and you're not spies, then one will go back and bring this Benjamin, this younger brother, while the other nine await here with me in prison. Then he lets them stew on this for three days. Can you imagine what, what went through their minds? I can imagine it, I think, because Scripture tells us that three days later, in verse 42, they had come to realize that God was dealing with them according to their sin. Joseph must have sensed this, so he changed the test up in verse 18. You remember, he was going to have one go back and get Benjamin while the other nine remained. Now he flip-flops that. Verse 18, Then Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live. For I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your house. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. The test of these nine who would return home would be to obediently follow Joseph's orders and return with their youngest brother in tow. The question begs, why did he choose to incarcerate Simeon while the others went home? Well, if you look at Simeon's life earlier in Genesis, it's easy to make a case against him for being the most violent bully of a brother of the the ten older brothers. Not only was he a bully, but he had committed murder. His temper is well documented earlier in, in Genesis, and Joseph may have chosen him to stay in custody in order to teach him a lesson that would last much longer than the other nine. Perhaps Simeon was the one that began the whole process of taking Joseph and putting him into the pit. The Bible is not clear on that, but that would be my guess. The process for repentance. Number one, the motivation for for repentance, the soberness of speech, the solitude of the heart, the obedience to change. And here's process number five, where we see the acknowledgement of sin. The acknowledgement of sin. In our remaining passage, we finally hear the rumblings of a confession of guilt, an admission of sin. No, they are not where they need to be yet, but this is a good beginning. Remember, as they speak to Joseph, Joseph understands them, of course, because he speaks Hebrew, he's born a Hebrew, but they don't know that. And so there's actually an intermediate, intermediate, a translator that they're speaking through, 
And the translator listens to the Hebrew and then he turns towards Joseph and says it again. Of course, Joseph completely understands both perfectly. Verse 21, so these ten brothers think and believe that th when they speak Hebrew, he won't be able to understand them. And so they speak freely. Verse 21, then they said to one another, these ten brothers, we are truly guilty concerning our brother for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against this boy? <laughs> They're starting to, you know, to, to, to go at it here a little bit. And you would not listen. Therefore... Behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. The brothers are finally beginning to take responsibility for what they had done 25 years previously. They began to realize that sin has consequences. Suddenly and without warning, the floodgates were opened and all the two dozen years of suppressed guilt, shame, and regret come flowing out of them. Reuben, believing that Joseph is dead, understands that God may require their own blood, their very lives, for what they had done. In effect, the brothers had sentenced their little brother to death when they sold him into slavery. As I said earlier, the average slave in the Egyptian culture at this time only survives five to seven years. They work him so hard, they just work him to death, literally. It's 25 years later, Reuben and his brothers believe he can't be alive anymore. And because they believe Joseph to be an Egyptian ruler, they spoke openly about what had happened, and Joseph was overwhelmed by Reuben's statement and their partial confession. Perhaps Joseph didn't know what Reuben had said. At that moment, their little brother was undone, and he removed himself from the presence in order to weep. Verse 24, and he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them. If the story ended right here, it would feel right to me. But what Joseph did next doesn't seem to fit into the drama. Additionally, it must have felt quite harsh to these ten brothers. Here's Joseph's next move. He comes back from weeping, and then he spoke with them some more. And then he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Remember, Joseph is the forerunner of Jesus and God was using his life to give mankind a glimpse of what the Messiah, God in the flesh, would look like. I've shared before that I'm absolutely eating up the 19th century pastor F.B. Meyer's commentary on the life of Joseph. And this week, one of his insights just seemed to, to pierce my heart. Allow me to read it to you. Old English. Whilst these men spoke thus, Joseph stood by them. There was no emotion on those compressed features. No response in those quiet eyes. Remember, he couldn't let on that he understood them. Ah, how often do anguished souls go to priests, ministers, and friends with the bitter tale of anguish. They knew not that one is standing by who hears and understands all and longs to throw aside every barrier in order to bring them aid. True, he speaks to them by an interpreter, but if they would only speak straight to him, he would speak directly to their waiting hearts. There is a curious contrast in verse 24, F.B. says. First, we learned that 
he turned himself about from them and wept. And the next we are told that he took Simeon and bound him before their eyes. The brethren only saw the latter of these two actions and must have thought him rough and unkind. How they must have trembled in his presence. But they knew not the heart of tender love that was beating beneath all this seeming hardness, nor could they guess that the retention of Simeon was intended to act as a silk cord to bring the brothers back to him. And as part of the process of awakening the memory of another brother whom they had lost years before. It is thus continually in life's discipline. We suffer and suffer keenly. Imprisoned, bereaved, rebuked, we count God harsh and hard. We little realize how much pain He is suffering as He causes us pain. How often the tender heart of our brother, Jesus, is filled with grief welling up within us or within him as he makes himself strange and deals so roughly with us. If we could both see the tender face behind the visor and know how noble a heart beats beneath the mailed armor, we should feel that we were as safe amid his rebukes as ever we were amid his tenderest caresses. End of quote. Sometimes it, it just feels like God is so hard, so harsh. But let me tell you, how many of us felt that way when our fathers were correcting us, when we had done something foolish? I'm glad my dad at times dealt harshly with me. I wouldn't have listened to him if he hadn't. God used Joseph's discipline with his brothers to bring about their repentance and, and of course, their forgiveness, which we see at the end of our story. The brothers still have some lessons to learn in the coming chapters. They will go back to Israel. And they will have a long conversation with Dad because he's not about to let Benjamin go to Egypt. Simeon's been taken into custody, and you want my, my last son from Rachel? Not going to happen, boys. They have quite a conversation. So I asked myself this week, what, is, what does a genuine heart of repentance sound like on God's ears? And ours as well. What, what, what's it sound like to, to have a genuine heart of repentance? Well, I don't think you'll find a better, more powerful example in all of the Bible than when King David went to God and poured out his heart through the writing of a song after having committed both adultery and murder against Bathsheba and Uriah, her husband. It's a beautiful repentance. It's found in Psalm 51. Let me read it to you. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil thing in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. David understood that repentance begins in here. And these brothers had a little ways to go before that repentance entered their heart. What a beautiful primer on how to confess our sins and move forward with God forgiven. While Joseph's brothers had not quite arrived at repentance, they're on their way. I encourage you to come back next week for the rest of the story. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that there is a way back to you, and his name is Jesus. We thank you that you parted. You loved us so much that you gave us your son, Scripture tells us, that anyone that would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, that we could know the joy of salvation, that we could know you we had been separated from sin for so long from you. And the hole in our heart that was missing can only be filled by knowing you. And Father, I, I just pray to you and ask tonight if there's even one in here that hasn't found what they're looking for in life, hasn't found what fills that hole in their life, that tonight would be their night to discover the forgiveness that only comes through a relationship with you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, the one that made it all possible. When he died on the cross, shed his blood in our place, took on our guilt, our penalty, and in turn gave us his robe of righteousness in the holy exchange. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love for us. And thank you, that we can know that you do not punish us, but that you're always developing us and bringing us closer to maturity. Lord, I pray for anyone in here tonight, and I know there's several going through some really difficult things, that tonight they would sense your presence, they would sense your loving hand upon them, and that as they go through the storm, they would come out the other side better for it, and more prepared for the next chapter you've written in their life. Thank you for the hope that we only find in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you guys stand and worship with us? Jehovah Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me. Yes, my God shall supply all my need according to His riches and glory. He shall give His angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh. 
Amen, and He does care for you. Tonight, if you entered into this building and you don't have a relationship with God, let me encourage you to make a decision tonight that will change your future forever. As I often say, it's too dangerous to leave this building if you don't know where you're going to go after this life. We are eternal beings. All of us are going to have an eternity. There's only one catch here it ends in one of two places and you get to, ch to decide where that is choose tonight to follow Jesus choose tonight to make him your Lord and your Savior and you can secure heaven in the future but a relationship with God that begins tonight don't go out of here with a big question mark as to where you go after you die or why you were born God will give you both answers and if you already know Christ go out and tell somebody else the time for sharing the gospel is now we're not heaven There's no need to share the gospel in heaven God's given us an order to do it now reach out to that neighbor reach out to that loved one and share Christ with them while there's still time God bless you have a great night take care <laughs>